Hello, everybody, and welcome to Prediction, Machine Learning, and Causal Inference. What does it mean for population health and data science? This is a conversation hosted by the Dalana School of Public Health. At our school, we have five interdisciplinary research clusters, which we have created to provide leadership and impactful research and educational opportunities in areas that mean a lot to the school identified in our academic priorities. And in one of those areas is using data science, artificial intelligence, and emerging technologies in informatics and analytics to improve population health and health systems. And in this cluster, we have a variety of activities. One is conversations like the one we're having today. These conversations are meant to foster critical thought and debate regarding data science in the context of public health and health systems. We also have education and training initiatives, as well as uh, research initiatives to support high impact data science related research in the context of public health and health systems. We've just funded our first six projects in this area, and you can check out our websites to see the type of work that's happening in the area. So today, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce uh, this effort, my co-lead, Dr. Michael Chayton, who really pushed us to have this session, um, as well as we'll be introducing our keynote speaker. Dr. Michael Chayton is an Associate Professor in Epidemiology at the School of Public Health and a scientist at KMH in the Institute for Mental Health Policy Research. He's an epidemiologist. He specializes in population-based mental health, tobacco, and addiction uh, research. And right now, he's leading two CHR grants that aim to use machine learning methods for causal inference. So uh, perfect uh, experience and motivation to really drive this conversation today. It's really critical to getting the event started. And uh, he's going to spend a few minutes framing the session, telling you why we're hosting the session, and introducing our keynote speaker. Just in terms of housekeeping, uh, I'll ask you if you have questions of, our, of any of our speakers or panelists to please use the Q&A function and we'll integrate them through the talk. And I will introduce our panel speakers in more detail after our keynote address. So over to you, Michael. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, I to thank you as well for uh, sponsoring this event. Uh, I think it's a, a wonderful opportunity for us to, to get together to speak on this, uh, I think, really interesting issue in epidemiology. I'd like to start with something a, a little bit embarrassing, though, something to admit. Um, I have been, for many years, uh, a risk factor epidemiologist. Um, so for you younger uppies, just avert your ears for a moment, and I'll tell about the, the unfortunate process that I admit I've taken for far too many studies. It start with an important outcome for public health. For me, that would often be something like smoking cessation or vaping initiation. For others of you, it may be uh, other behavioral uh, or, or health outcomes. And in studies, both cross-sectional and longitudinal, I'd then be interested in, in the association of risk factors, which risk factors predict or demographics predict that outcome. I would take all these variables that we would have access based somewhat on theory, you know, theoretically, uh, maybe using a DAG, probably not, um, and throw them all into a logistic regression and then um, discuss all the variables where P is less than 0.05. And so before you start throwing stones, I'm not alone in my sins against statistics. And, um, and at least I never ever did stepwise regression. But when I started reading about machine learning, I thought here is a better way, it, a way of being able to identify those risk predictors or uh, factors that can use all of our available var uh, variables without necessarily relying on uh, theoretical uh, input in, in front and without running afoul of statistics and, and really moral principles to be able, able to best identify the most important predictors. And I think, I'm not sure we're gonna discuss that today, but that concept here where, we're, where machine learning really identifies with the important predictors is one that we can bring back into, into public health. And I think moves us beyond this old paradigm that was based on p-values. 
But I was working with uh, Nicholas Mitsitsakis and Ray Fui, uh, a, a student, uh, on, on putting their grants together uh, to use machine learning to look at uh, uh, vaping and to uh, predictors of mental health and substance use among LGBTQ youth. Realize that the idea of the predictor alone, at least in machine learning, it's not really sufficient for public health. Um, I would keep pushing them. Uh, I, I'm pushing back on this idea that the predictors in machine learning were not causal. Even uh, in, in our old risk factor paradigm, I was looking not just for predictors on their own, but independent risk factors. That was the idea of throwing all these variables into a regression, is that the, the variables that came out or remained uh, 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 statistically significant at the end were, you know, at least, uh, you know, to uh, my mind, in some ways, those uh, those causally related variables, the true uh, predictors, not just uh, that, not just those ones that uh, are our strongest relationship. And I think that is what we're looking for in public health. We are looking for those true predictors. We are looking for those true causal connections. And I think what we want to get out of machine learning is to help in being able to identify what are those causal factors to use these tools and to use this way of thinking. But I think our methods for how to do that are still developing. And uh, I'm delighted to have uh, our, our panel and our, our guest here today uh, to help us un speak about some of those issues around causal inference and public health and data science. So I'm delighted to introduce uh, Tony Blakely. Uh, he's an epidemiologist and a public health medicine specialist who has been thinking about this intersection of machine learning and, and causal inference. He is committed to answering questions about which public health interventions will achieve the greatest improvements in health and social outcomes, reduce inequalities in health, and to do so cost-effectively. While principally an epidemiologist, he uses and combines methods from multiple disciplines, biostatistics, economics, econometrics, and computer and data science. He is the director of the Population uh, Interventions PI unit within the Center for Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health. Uh, he's speaking with us from uh, Australia today. Um, and the PI unit includes projects using contemporary epidemiological and econometric methods applied to existing data and through to projects using simulated simulation models to estimate the health gains and cost impacts of interventions such as tobacco tax, dietary counseling, and so on. Uh, Dr. Bakley collaborates with the University of Washington Institute of Health Metrics and the University of Otago to build the next generation macro simulation models that intersect easily with the global burden of disease data to allow multi-country evaluations, including a little project uh, they're working with us uh, at, at the Ontario Tobacco Research Unit. And cutting across all of Blakely's research is a strong focus and interest in an epidemiological and quantitative research methodologies. He teaches short courses in advanced epidemiology and simulation modeling in both Australia and New Zealand, and has co-authored a book on the history of mortality design in New Zealand, and published approximately 300 peer-reviewed journal articles. And uh, again, I'm delighted to uh, have him here today, and uh, uh, please uh, go ahead. Good day, everybody. It's very early in the morning here in Melbourne. Um, I've had my cup of tea and we're ready to go. Um, so thank you very much for the invitation to present here. Now, here come the disclaimers. Um, COVID has meant that I haven't even opened these slides up for about 18 months. So this is a good fun for me to be back into it. But what it does mean is when we get to the discussion, I'm going to be relying on some of you out there to perhaps have been more on top of what's happened in the last 18 months. My job today is to try and put a framework around the intersection of causal inference with machine learning. Now, my journey to this is not the same as Michael's, but a little bit similar. And I'll come back to that uh, journey in just a sec. So let's actually start off with um, Judea Pearl. So Judea Pearl, um, very senior person, one of the initiators of artificial intelligence, uh, 
he's even though he's one of the gurus of machine learning, he would still say this: "You are smarter than your data. Data do not understand causes and effects; humans do." Now, this is utterly critical. I'll acknowledge that there are some machine learning methods being developed at the moment that can just go into the data and perhaps extract causality, but really, I still think that's pretty much fairy land. What we need to do is if we're going to use some of this artificial intelligence stuff, the machine learning, the ensembles, we still need to think and have theory to approach our data. So for example, the simplest DAG you've ever seen, what is it? You got your exposure E, your outcome Y, C is a covariate. In this case, it's on the back door because the arrow is going from C into E and from C to Y. So this is the simplest example of a confounder. So do you adjust for this? Do you throw this in your regression uh, hopper where you pour all the data in that Michael was describing? If you're after a causal association of E with Y, yeah, of course. This is your classic confounder, so you adjust for this. Here's another DAG, same three variables, same structure, slightly different arrow directions. The arrow is now going from E to C, so C is a mediator. Do you adjust for C if you're looking for the total effect of E onto Y, the causal effect of E onto Y? No, because you would over adjust. Here's the same diagram with causal diagram with the arrows in slightly different direction. There's our exposure, there's our outcome, and there's C now. And it's actually got arrows going in both ways. It is no longer C for confounder, but C for collider. Do you adjust for C to try and identify the causal effect of E on Y? No, because it's basically going to induce a selection bias or collider bias. Does machine learning know the causal structure in your data? No, it does not know the causal structuring in the data. That requires hundreds of years of theory, sociology, biological sciences, and constructing theories that we can never be quite sure are true. And we rely on theories of learning, of epistemology, such as a Popperian way of falsification, for example, and we move on. But we have to bring as scientists to the data our prior understanding. Can machine learning produce causal effects if you just let it rip with no instruction from you? Not straightforwardly. There are, as I said, some methods emerging. I uh, haven't kept the breast of it in the last 18 months, but essentially, I think for our purpose epidemiologists, the answer is clearly no. Now, I'm going to pull on Miguel Hernan here. This is a paper, you know, everybody knows who Miguel Hernan is, probably one of our most eminent epidemiologists in the world at the moment. And this is a paper, sometimes you read papers and they're just so obviously <laughs> right, but very simple. And you think, why didn't I write that? Jeffrey Rose, for example, prevention paradox. Well, here's an example. Just Miguel saying, well, what's the epidemiology? It's three things at the moment, and it's intersection with data science. It's description. There is nothing wrong with descriptive epidemiology. There's a lot of benefit from it. I do it all the time. In fact, I work with the IHME, as Michael said in the introduction, the home of the GBT, and they do fantastic descriptive epidemiology with heaps and heaps of machine learning. So their job every year is to work out the morbidity and mortality, incidence and prevalence of 200 and something, even more depending on how far down you go, diseases, for every sex and age group in every country for this year and every year back to 1990. It's a massive, there's a billion data points in here. How do they do it? My friend and colleague, A.B. Flaxman, developed the method of doing it. Basically, it's a combination of meta-regression and machine learning. So what they're doing is doing a meta regression on all the data that pull everything in there and then predicting. So for example, in the Solomon Islands where they may not have good data on coronary heart disease, they might borrow some data from nearby countries and use that to help predict it. And so it's a combination of ensemble machine learning and 
a regression type of approach to smooth across it. So that's fantastic descriptive epidemiology because people like myself then go and use that data to do simulation of the future. Policymakers use it, yada, yada. It's a fantastic descriptive epidemiological pursuit. Then there's predictions. And this is getting close to what Michael was saying about pouring all the data into the hopper. Now, think about cardiovascular disease risk. Now, in New Zealand and Australia, and I think in the Australia and Canada, as well, and US and Canada as well, is that we actually use this a lot for good reason. So we would try and predict who in the population is at most risk of getting cardiovascular disease. And at that point, we're just stratifying the population. And when we're doing that, we could put something like high density lipoproteins into our equation. And it will come out strongly as predictive. But we know from the Mendelian randomization studies that it's not causal. In fact, it's not at all causal. What it is is the LDLs and the triglycerides that are actually the causal parts. So how did this come to be? This came to be, my view, is that HDL is very stable in the blood. Whereas LDL goes up and down and triglycerides go up and down, heaps like this. And what that means is that the HDL, because it's correlated with those two things, is a bit more steady. It's got a signal in there and it comes out as being predictive. Yet it's the other two things that move around so much and vary over time that are actually probably the causal ones, but it's harder to pick them up because they've got measurement error if you're trying to pick up the average level. So you could use HDL, and we do, to predict who's going to get coronary heart disease. But if you then go and design a drug to work on the HDL, it's going to do nothing. Indeed, when those first Mendelian randomization studies came out, I think it was GlaxoSmithKline withdrew a billion dollars from their area of investment based on the Voice et al. paper 2012 Lancet. So that's how powerful the Mendelian randomization is. But if you're just trying to predict, predict strata one, strata two, strata three, strata four, of the population for then doing a treatment on, it works because you then stop that point of prediction and then you go and look up the randomized trials and find what treatment works and apply them to those stratified populations who have a different starting risk. That's good combination of epidemiology and medicine. But it doesn't mean to say that the variables in your predictive equation are the ones that you jump over here and then act on, assuming that's going to change the disease incidence. So prediction's all good, but we need to understand where it starts and where it stops as far as its utility. Then there's causal inference, which is what we're going to focus on today. Now, is using data to predict the counterfactual world um, go to use? Machine learning can be used in this prefront. I'm just going to stop here and talk about this. So we have been teaching epidemiology for, you know, before machine learning really took off. We used to always talk about this thing, predictions over here, causal inference over here, never shall they meet. They're different beasts. And then along come some of these new counterfactual methods, potential outcomes, marginal structural models, G computation, all that sort of stuff. And it's sort of, I think for many of us, and um, for me it was a few years ago, I don't know how it was for some of you, suddenly clicked, oh my goodness, we have worlds colliding here. Because these new counterfactual methods often have a pre-final step where you're predicting something. You're getting good prediction of the exposure, propensity scores. You're getting good prediction of the outcome, G computation. But you do that prediction and get some, you create a data set or you create a weighting variable that then is used in the final step. So it's a two-step process, some form of prediction of a potential outcome, say. And then having predicted the potential outcomes, you then do an analysis on data that's got real data in there and predicted outcomes. And this is where prediction and causal inference meet in a way that I find most fascinating. And because prediction and causal inference are meeting, we can now pull in on the prediction side what is extraordinary advances in artificial intelligence and machine learning. So we have this situation where worlds are colliding. Prediction, causal inference, we treat them quite separately, are coming together because of the development of some of these methods that use a final pre-processing step. 
That's what we're going to talk about today. So this is from the paper that myself and John Lynch, uh, Kern, Rebecca Bentley and Sherry Rose uh, wrote uh, and published in the International Journal of EP a couple of years ago now. It's the one that's got the title of When Worlds Collide. And for what it's worth, we see it, causal inference requires theory and prior knowledge. That's, you know, going back to the idea that you need to bring theory and thought to it. Judea Pearl, the data doesn't necessarily tell you exactly what's going on. To structure the analyses, you need to implant, you need to impose, might be a better word, impose your thought on it. How do we do that as epidemiologists? With a DAG, <laughs> with a directed acyclic graph. That's how we bring our theory to the data. And we do that before we touch the data. We construct our theory and then we go and do the analysis. Now, having done the analysis, we may decide that, gosh, there's something we missed in there or somebody comes along with another example or something that's the confounder or mediator or collider, and we might change things. But the general process of scientific discovery here, from our point of view, think, structure, DAG, analysis. Anyway, where do we get up to? Only the second sentence. And is not usually thought of as an arena for the application of prediction modeling. That's the way we used to think up until 10 years ago, I guess. And then we started having this evolution of new methods and backing, I call it backing the epidemiological bus out. We, we post-World War II, Framium developed all these regression methods and we're right in there using the regression methods and stuff. Now we're back the epidemiological bus out and said, what if we actually thought counterfactually and we tried to posit what the counterfactual was as if the exposure hadn't been there. I really think about the exchangeability. What if they had not been exposed to that exposure and trying to think counterfactually rather than just dealing with the observed data? So we're bringing a different theoretical perspective to bear on it as well. However, contemporary causal inference methods based on counterfactual potential outcomes approaches often include that pro processing step before the final estimation. So I think you should have that by now. Causal inference methods covered include propensity scores, inverse probability of treatment weights, G computation, and targeted maximum likelihood estimation. That's the way that we broke it down at the least. Machine learning has been used more for propensity scores in TML, TMLE, and there's potential to use it in G computation estimation of IPTW. So, a bit of a take home message at this point. So far, we've seen machine learning used a lot to generate propensity scores. And not only to generate the scores, but to also predict, predict's the wrong word here, to try and tease out which of the variables might be best to include in your propensity score. So there's both the, if you've got really big data, like you're working with an HMO or some health service provider and you've got a gazillion data points, you might first want to filter down to those variables to include. So you can use machine learning to pull out the ones that are best to include and then develop your score with those as well. Target maximum likelihood estimation, we'll come back to the end. It's something that I haven't used myself and it's pretty uh, fancy. Uh, some of you may have more experience with that than me. All right, so in the paper, we go through this type of way whereby we think through these methods and we think about, can we use machine learning and artificial intelligence for these methods that are about the third part of epidemiology, which is causal inference? So yeah, it's great for the predictive stuff, GBD. It's great for prediction of strata, predicting your strata of people who are at risk of getting CVD or diabetes, or whatever. And then you bring along your drug that's tested or your treatment that's tested in an RCT or has other forms of causal inference. We're now down at that last part, the causal inference part. So this is for Michael Chayton and all of you have done the old regression stuff, you know, framing him the epidemiological bus down there. We've developed these fantastic methods. And so what do you do? You run a regression model. Um, and it would, you know, expected, so just as a notation here, I think most people will be comfortable with it, but I'll walk through it. Expected value of the outcome. Vertical line means conditional on or adjusting for. X is your exposure, C is your covariate. So that's the expectation. And there's some function here, some logistic regression, so Poisson regression is something like that. So you're running that regression. Now, could machine learning assist here? Could we run that regression, not just as our logistic one, but it's just throw it at the machine learning or you know, throw it at the um, random for us and just get it to do something? Well, you could. You'd have to still use your DAG because you don't want to put into that 
machine learning algorithm, things that are colliders or on the causal pathway, because that will stuff up your estimate of the causal effect. So you could do it, but if you did it, you'd have a lot of trouble pulling out what the effect size was for your exposure X, because it'll be all sorts of interaction terms or all sorts of bifurcations on forest, you know, random forest and all that sort of stuff. So it'd be damn hard to try and pull out of that machine learning approach you use exactly something nice and simple, like a coefficient for how much your coronary heart disease changes per 10 millimeters mercury of increasing blood pressure as your exposure. It'd be hard to do that. So probably not the best use here, although people may give it a go. What about propensity scores? Okay, so what are we doing with propensity scores? Well, we're actually doing a pre-processing step. We're predicting the exposure. We're creating a propensity score to predict your exposure given the covariates, given your confounders up here. And so then you use it, you guys know this stuff, you use it by them matching. So you've got you know, people who've been exposed and not, and you match them in bands of your propensity score, or you might even include the propensity score in the regression, although we know that's not quite the best practice, but it probably doesn't make too much difference. And then you, uh, um, or you can adjust for your propensity score, as I said. Now, what are the guidelines here? Well, you still have to think. <laughs> you can't just throw everything to predict your propensity score because you could still get your colliding bias and stuff. So what do you do? You include all the confounders. So you still have to identify the confounders. Plus, perhaps predictors of Y. It's a bit of debate about that, but I think most people have settled into the idea that you can use things that predict Y, but not necessarily X. So they're not necessarily confounders, but they do help a little bit. And optimize both prediction of X and selection of the confounding variables. Remember I talked about before that you can use the machine learning if you've got massive data. You can use the machine learning to work out which variables to just even include to start with and then develop your propensity score. So could machine learning assist? Well, it's pretty obvious from what I've been talking. Yeah, in fact, it's where machine learning has probably used, been used the most in causal inference work in epidemiology. And, you know, think about it. We don't give a toss. We don't <laughs> interpret the coefficients in the propensity score. They're, it's not that they're irrelevant. It's just that we don't need to know what they're doing. We just need something that predicts the exposure. And so that's another way of realizing, ah, oh, machine learning, we can use it here because we're just predicting the exposure. Then we do our, our final estimation step. What about using inverse probability of treatment weights, the sort of thing that you use in a marginal structural model, but not necessarily just marginal structural models? Is there a pre-final causal estimation step? Absolutely. You're predicting exposure and constructing those inverse probability treatment weights at each time step, if you're doing a marginal structure model with panel data, right? And so you've got that part there. The final step is where you've used the weights and you might well end up do a very simple analysis of just, you know, cumulative number of waves exposed to, I don't know, physical activity or high alcohol consumption onto some outcome. It's very, very simple final estimation step, but it's got these really fancy weights behind it to weight the data to get rid of the confounding. And so that's what our IPTWs do. Prediction guidelines, so this is the part to predict the IPTWs. You include the time invariant and variant confounders up to that time step, not the stuff beyond it because that would be a mediator. So you still have to think, you still have to have your DAG. And um, could machine learning assist? Well, you've got the message by now, the answer is yes because we're not interpreting the coefficients used to predict the IPTWs. We interpret the coefficient that we get off our IPTW weighted analysis, be that categorical regression at the end of the day. So yeah, machine learning's on. Now, I'm just gonna deviate a little bit here. G computation, or G formula. Some of you will have seen this. This is probably given that modern epidemiology textbook hasn't been updated since 2008. This is from Miguel and Jamie Robbins' textbook, which they keep updating online. Causal inference, what is it called? What if causal inference, I think that's the title. And you've got these Greek gods. And there is their level of some confounder. In this case, it might be their severity of disease or their comorbidity. 
And this is whether or not they had a heart transplant here. And this is their outcome, alive or dead. I know they're gods and they're supposed to be immortal, but for now we'll consider that they could actually die. And this is their outcome, alive or dead. And this is the observed data. And when you're going to move forward to something like G formula or G computation, just trick is now to say, well, what would have been their outcome had they all been unexposed? Now we observed unexposed for maybe half of them. And for the other half, we have to actually estimate what their predicted outcome would be. And then we do it as though they're all treated. And so what we're doing here is we're doubling the data whereby we're trying to give everybody an expected value if they've been treated and expected value if they've been untreated for a binary exposure or intervention. So the method has four steps. Expansion of the data set, as per here. The outcome modeling. So we could do something non-parametric and indeed you can go to the textbook and you can work through this and it's just a whole bunch of conditional probabilities. And you can calculate what the expected value of all these is based on the observed data. Here. Now, the key assumption here is, you know, I think it's, it's easy to be seduced by these contemporary methods like marginal structural models, G computation. I think, wow, they're giving us the causal estimate. Well, actually, just think a sec. They've still got assumptions in them, like every other method. And the assumption here is that you have information on all the confounding, the L. So if you can believe, that having adjusted for L or thinking within strata of L, that you now have exchangeability, that people are identical as far as their risk of what outcome Y, other than their exposure A, i.e. you've achieved exchangeability by stratifying by, by adjusting by, by standardizing by, by whatever method you use to get rid of L, then these methods work. But I've seen so many times where people with martial structural models, because they've run a martial structural model, they think they're identifying the cause of effect. Well, maybe. It still requires that absolutely fundamental assumption <laughs> that you do know what are your confounders. You have measured them well. You've structured them in your equation and your analysis well. And that you've specified them correctly. By specify, I mean something like income association health. As your income goes up, you get diminishing marginal returns. So you just can't put it as a linear association. You need to allow for that somehow by putting it as a categorical log of the income, something like that. So I, I just as a, a warning for uh, the newer people here, or anybody actually, even some of us older ones who are using these methods and think that they're somehow magically generating causal inference. No, you still need to think and you still need to have perfect information on your else. Going back to this, so as long as we've got perfect information and we've got perfect theory and we know what we're doing, we can actually assume that there's exchangeability and therefore predict the outcomes. We can do it non-parametrically by just doing some you know, calculations with your calculator or an Excel spreadsheet, doesn't take too much. Or you can move on to parametric. What do we mean by that? We mean that there might be lots and lots of L's. And so we can use some form of logistic regression. We can pull on Michael Chayton's experience, or we could even you know where this is heading, don't you? <laughs> use something like a machine learning algorithm to do that prediction. So that's that point there. And then you're just using, uh, um, you standardize at the end by the distribution of your confounder, the final step, we won't go into that today. So G formula to estimate intervention fix. It is, once you've done that, so basically you've created a, a formula, be that something you've done by hand or in an Excel or something bigger, like a logistic regression or even maybe machine learning, and you're predicting the potential outcomes at each extra wave. So you might have one, two, three, four, five waves of data and use the first wave to predict the outcomes in the second wave and the covariates. And then having done that, you use that data to then predict the next wave and the next wave and the next wave. So having done that, the beauty of this, for somebody like me who's interested in intervention effects, I want to actually know how the world will change if we intervened on something that we think is causal, if we intervened on somebody's body mass index, if we intervened on their alcohol consumption,
If we intervened on their platelet count, something like COVID, for example, it's like we're the hand of God. We're going to reach in here and we're going to tweak something. And so the beauty here is that you've got all these estimations of the potential outcome. And it doesn't take much extra to just reach in there at wave three when all women turned 55, whatever, and just change the BMI a little bit because you're going to posit that you did an intervention into here. You've got some theory back here that a physical activity and weight reduction program has been done in a randomized controlled trial somewhere. And it shows that it reduces the BMI by 1.5 units, this intervention. And so you'd say, well, what effect would that have in my population? So you reach in there and you reduce the BMI by 1.5 on the woman that would have been eligible for that trial. And then having done that, you've basically changed the exposure in there in wave three, say. And then what you can do is see how that flows through in all these predictions and what actually happens to their risk of developing asthma or coronary heart disease, whatever it is you're interested in, at some time in the future. It's really, really great. It's getting close to what the, I think the fundamental purpose of epidemiology is to estimate those intervention effects. The other thing you should notice is when you do that, because time lags are built into these things because you're observing people repeated measures, often you'll get disappointingly small changes in population health. But that is the nature of what we do in public health of prevention. Often when we intervene, it, you know, it's a small change that takes many years to flow through. It is actually a reality check for us. Right, for example, one could reduce everyone's BMI by one unit, I said 1.5 before, randomly make 10% of smokers, ex-smokers, et cetera. Then estimate what this will do for the total population mortality or disease or other rates. So here's an example, nearly 10 years ago now. Garcia, I can't pronounce this properly, um, Murak, somebody else will know exactly how to say that. Um, so high BMI is associated with high asthma rates. So what might be the impact of changing BMI and asthma? So some of you would have seen this paper uses the nurses' health study. So a, you know, one of the world's best repeated measures, longitudinal studies. You draw your DAG, use your exposure, which is BMI, covariates, unknowns. Remember they put the unknowns on here, so we can't measure them. We either haven't measured them and we know about them or we don't know about them and they might still be out there. So you know, we, our methods are contingent on having somehow got rid of those. And there's your time viewing exposure there. So whatever the BMI was two years ago, whatever it is now. So that's a, it's a generic because it's got all the waves in there in one hit rather than having the DAG going, you know, one of those really big complex DAGs. It's just saying this is what happens from time step T minus one to time step T. So time variance, so it's many more steps than we did for the, than you could do for the Greek gods if you went and played for that example. I do encourage you to, it's very nice for understanding what's going on here. And you build models that predict those time varying L's and A's at each subsequent wave. And then you could use something like Monte Carlo simulation uh, of how the future plays out when intervening on BMI. What do I mean then? Well, so imagine you're using Michael's logistic regression. This is what usually happens. So you use a logistic regression. You might even use the same logistic regression for wave T to T minus one. And you just basically take all the data, you stack it and assume that whatever the predictive equation is from to this time point here is the same to that time point, that time point. So you do one equation that you can then use again and again and again. Or you might, if you've got enough data, enough time to do a separate equation for each wave because you know it might be females going across the menopause where associations might vary because of that transition point. And then having done that, what do we mean by Monte Carlo simulation? Well, you've now got your regression equation and there's going to be some uncertainty about each of the coefficients in that equation. So this coefficient here might be 0.23, but it's got some random error or standard um, deviation about that. And what you do with the Monte Carlo is like a typewriter. You're going to do 10,000 runs and a, a typewriter, they go across and then they go ka-ching there, ka-ching. For those of you who remember what a typewriter is. And each time you go across, you sample from the probability distribution mass, from the normal distribution on whatever scale it is about each parameter, this value of 
variable L1, this value of variable L2, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, including the one that you've reached in there and you've said, I want to shift this by 1.5 units. And you do that thousands and thousands of times. So you get a range of the possible outcome measures and the effect size to then construct your own 95 or 90% simulation interval about it so that we have some measure of it's probably a bit moving away from just random error here. It's moving into also the uncertainty, the simulation interval. So that's what we mean about the Monte Carlo simulation there. Now, key advantage of G-form is that you can report the rates. I think this is, sometimes we just need to pull back and think about what are our methods offering us. And the really cool thing about this to me, as well as the fact that it's dealing with the causal structure and the data, is you end up with predicted outcomes. And it is so, 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 so easy to now just calculate your risk difference and your absolute risks or your absolute rates, as well as your risk ratios. So remember the epidemiological bus post uh, World War II, Framian, it's gone in there and it's developed all these regression methods that use the log of the outcome and therefore nicely generate for us rate ratios and odds ratios They nicely develop relative measures. And we've been sort of beholden to that since World War II because we've got the methods that do that nicely. And that's been great. But actually, what often matters more for public health is not your relative risk change, but actually the absolute change. And so having backed the epidemiological bus out and come in with this new counterfactual way of thinking, uh, potential outcomes approach, we've generated data. We're in our final pre-processing step. And we can just now look at the data really simply and calculate absolute differences as well as relative differences. I think that's one of the biggest gains here, actually. So here's an example. Um, I'm not going to go through that text. That's too boring to do this early on a Thursday morning in Melbourne and late in the afternoon on a Thursday in Toronto. Right. But just to give you an idea of what they did. So here, they're doing things on the absolute scale. So here's the um, asthma risk. So the absolute risk of getting asthma uh, over a certain period of time of 1.5%. And then they basically put these interventions in place. So primary interventions lose 5% of BMI, whatever it is. So you can see here, not only are they using DAGs to structure their analysis, but they're also now saying, and the intervention effect size will be something that we think is plausible. It's not just going to be a 10 unit change in BMI. It's going to be that that they saw that you could do in this program over here by intervention trialists. And we're going to bring it to bear on the data now and see what effect it would have on the overall population. So in, estimating that intervention effect. And you can see here, when we get down to here, we do a joint intervention of some BMI loss and some physical activity increase. So you see this one's a bit more extreme. It's BMI loss for everybody over 23, whereas this one's just over 25. And you see these intervention effect size. Now you'll notice the other thing here is they're only giving one decimal plus because they've been humble. <laughs> We have a lot of uncertainty here in our estimates. So there's no need to present more than that. But what you can see here is that if you're a pessimist, glass half empty person, you're saying, oh gosh, this doesn't do much. After all that work, after my $20 million worth of NIH funding to get all this data, I'm only get a 0.2 percentage point reduction in asthma. Or you could say that it's reduced it by 15% if you do it on the relative risk scale. But this is, as I said before, a salient reminder to us in epidemiology that by the time you factor in all the things you can actually do in the real world and time lags and stuff, the actual cumulative effect of interventions might be quite small. I'll just divert for a sec. There's a guy over here in Australia called Simon Chapman who's been a prominent tobacco advocate. And I remember when I was actually doing my MPH PhD, I heard him talk once. And you know, he's talking in the context of tobacco control. And at that stage, you're saying tobacco control is like being pecked to death by ducks. And that each extra tobacco control intervention we do has a very small effect and it takes lots and lots and lots of things to do. And that's the nature of public health usually. Very seldom do you have a vaccine like Pfizer or Moderna that's got 95% vaccine efficacy for something like COVID that gives you a magic solution. Often we're doing lots of small things and eating away slowly or pecking to death like ducks some problem like BMI or smoking. All right, now this is outcome modeling. So remember before the propensity scores and the IPTWs, we're doing something to predict the exposure. 
So this is now outcome modeling. We're actually directly predicting the potential outcomes. We're predicting values of the Y in the model. And so you can, using both IPTW and G formula, you can do it both. So if you do an IPTW onto exposure and a G formula outcomes, you're doing both of them. And to think about it, that gives you two cracks at adjusting for confounding. That's where that term doubly robust comes because you've done something to adjust for or predict your exposure as well as something on the outcome level. Uh, doubly robust methods combine both IPW and GE formulations. So I'll come back to that with TMLE in a sec. So after that little side trip there into G computation, let's go through our schema here. So is there a pre-final causal estimation step that involves prediction of G computation? You betcha, you're estimating, you're predicting the potential outcomes as though all that had changed was their exposure, the exchangeability assumption. So you're doing this type of thing, the expected value of Y outcome, if you set the value of the exposure to whatever level you're gonna set it to for the counterfactual intervention on exposure X. You could also do it by setting the level of some mediator. So for example, myself, I often look at social inequality. So I might have Māori, non-Māori from my New Zealand research days. And then I might set the level of smoking at some counterfactual, which I believe might be achievable for interventions in the next five years and see what that does, not to the smoking differences in health, but what it does to the ethnic differences in health through acting on that mediator. So your G computation can be acting on the exposures or the mediators. Analysis of predicted outcomes uh, under both exposure and non-exposure. Use exposures and covariates that meet the confounder properties. So you still got to think and draw your data. You can't just throw this all at some fancy machine learning algorithm. But could machine learning assist? Yes, of course it can. Because you can use it to predict the coefficients or effect size in the equation doing the prediction over here, the potential outcomes. So you could use that as the prediction thing to get yourself set up for doing your final analysis on the data. Now, it hasn't actually been used that much yet in G computation. There's a student my colleague supervised here who's had a go at it uh, and found it quite difficult because it just takes so much time because you've got so much machine learning at each stage. And I understand from speaking to Laura and Michael that there's people in your school as well that have had difficulty making this work. I'd be interested to see what comes out in the panel discussion. Last night, I took a break from all the COVID work I've been doing the last 18 months and quickly did a Google Scholar. And there are examples of recent G computation using machine learning. So I just pulled out three there. Um, I'll make these slides available to people, but I simply found these using Google Scholar was nothing fancy. And so for example, this paper here in scientific reports, uh, super learner tended to outperform the other approaches in terms of both bias and variance, especially for smaller sample size. So these guys are finding that when you've got a small sample, the machine learning, if you do it correctly, presumably, I didn't get time to read the whole paper, actually helps you give you better causal inference here, or at least that's what they're deducing. This one, using a novel statistical approach, we confirmed associations between prenatal mercury exposure and lower cognitive function. So for these people, had a quick scan of the paper. They were addressing uh, an issue of pollutants um, and one that's been contested in environmental epidemiology could just like nutritional epidemiology, these causal effects are so hard to pull out because there's so many things going on and a bit of measurement error here or there could really stuff things up and you get the wrong association. So this is a contested area. It's where observational epidemiology is really struggling to try and find that causal effect size. So having different things we can pull out of the toolkit in this case saying, well, what about if we do G computation with machine learning? That idea that if multiple methods and different ways of doing it give you the same answer, you've got a bit of that consistency using a Bradford Hill criteria. And so that's what they're doing here. They're saying, look, using these methods, we still get the same answers. It's strengthening the case that this is a problem. <clears throat> now, let's finally finish up with targeted maximum likelihood estimation. I've not done this myself before. I find it pretty uh, head spinny stuff. <laughs> Uh, some of you may know this better than me, but here's my rather basic take on it. <laughs> now, this is doubly robust. So you're basically doing some protection on both the exposure and on the outcome. And it was actually developed uh, by people coming from the computer science area. So they, they didn't even develop the methods using Greek gods and 
stratifying and building up that way. They just came straight at it with machine learning both ways around. So uh, predict both the exposure and outcome. And it has a targeted update step that incorporates information from the propensity score function to reduce biases. So what it's actually doing, it's very clever. It's predicting the outcome. Actually, I'll come to that for equation set, but I'll say it verbally now. Predicting the outcome, which it's just, you know, like a type of regression model that's predicting the outcome given all the covariates. But in the targeting step, what it's doing is focusing more on just the exposure of all the other covariates to reduce the variance, to get more precision. So it's targeted because rather than the maximum likelihood, if you were using a regression model, not machine learning, rather than the maximum likelihood across all the covariate space, which just so happens to include one of them, which is called your exposure, which is the main variable of interest, rather than doing it that way, it does that first and then comes back and targets it based around where the action is on your exposure. At least that's how I understand it. And in discussion time, I'd welcome somebody correcting me if they think they can um, explain it better than that or if I've indeed got it wrong. Do you have to think? Of course you do. You have to include all potential confounders in both prediction functions. You can't over adjust. Could machine learning assist? Yes, indeed. As I said before, this has to be developed by people coming at this uh, from the computer science. So they just use machine learning from the get go. Um, and so to try and understand the difference between GCOMP TML and IPTW, this diagram is quite useful. It's, um, so Sherry Rose worked with us on the IJE paper. Uh, and she actually came out of UCL where the TMLE methods were developed. Now, with the G computation, you're estimating potential outcomes of Y given the covariates, and they use that to then work out your average treatment effect. With inverse probability of treatment weighting, you're using some propensity score or estimated uh, or creating an inverse probability weight because you're predicting the exposure given the covariates here. TMLE does both. You're predicting the outcomes and then you're targeting it by adding in some propensity score or prediction of exposure type of function here. So G computation optimizes the bias variance trade-off for the expected value of the outcome given the exposure and the covariance, not the parameter of interest. In contrast, TML includes the targeting step, which optimizes the bias variance trade-off on the given parameter of interest. So the TML comes along, takes this, and then optimizes it around the A, not just all of the A's and X and here. So at least that's how I understand it. I'm going to finish up with an example from a marginal structural model that we published in IDE. Gosh, it's three years ago now. Um, and this was with my colleague, uh, Rebecca Bentner, Bentley M. Baker, Kern Simmons um, and Judy Simpson, who's a biostatistician. And we were looking at repeated measures data of the effect of being in social housing on to mental health. Now, this is quite contentious because as you probably all, well, everybody, I think all our countries that people like to be on this call from have got a major problem with housing affordability, prices skyrocketing, housing stress, should the state provide social housing, should it not? And then if you just go and look at people in social housing, they'll tend to have worse mental health. Probably not due to the social housing per se, but because of who's in the social housing, i.e. selection into that confounding type of processes. And if you look at this field of research, the type of analysis hasn't moved much on beyond that. It's been looking pretty much just those single associations. So what we did here was we tried to use panel data to pull out the effect of changing your social housing to see whether that genuinely has an effect on changing mental health. So we actually tested, this is, this is already pretty passe, pretty old school, because we did this analysis about four years ago and I think things have moved on a lot. But for what it's worth, we tested three types of base learners of logistic regression uh, without interactions, but including cubic splines, yada, yada. Gradient-boosting based uh, gradient boosting machine, a type of machine learning, and a conditional inference for us. Now, both of these last two are types of decision trees where you break the data down, you break the data down, you break the data down, you break the data down. 
And we fitted the marginal structural models using the weights estimated by each of these three base lunars, um, as well as by the superlunar that kind of combines them like an ensemble. So it takes the weighted average and basic terms across those three machine learning separate approaches. And then we get the standardized mean difference between exposed and unexposed. Uh, now, the reason I'm presenting this is I think it's important that we're humble um, about our marginal structural models and our fancy methods as far as causal inference. Now, I can't quite see this because the blinking zoom things out of the top here, but if I remember correctly, this one is for the amount of time you're in social housing, and this one is for your transitions in and out. Now, we actually built the model more for this type of analysis here, the amount of time that you're in social housing. Now, what Kuhn did, he's a very bright statistician. He tried to, even though these are variables changing over time and stuff, he created this variable, which is a standardized difference using that variable standard deviation of what it was if between the exposed and the unexposed. Because if the inverse probability of treatment weights work perfectly, then for the people who um, got cumulative social housing or transitioning between social housing, they should have no difference when you weight the data for these covariates. Like a propensity score, when you wanted to see everything move to having no difference between your um, your 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 two part your your exposed and unexposed when you match on propensity score, you want to see the difference that found has become zero. So he's trying to approximate that thing here. And so if this if the method had worked perfectly, all these blue dots, which are after doing the IPTW, would be lined up along there. They're not, they're far from it. We're dealing with something that is highly structured, like social housing, it's so correlated with your income and so many other things, it's hard to create that exchangeability. So that's what it looks like there. The super lunar does better. So here we go, that's the basic way of doing logistic. And there's the super lunar. It is actually moving those blue dots closer to here, but it's still not perfect. So we, you know, we're still not, we're not achieving exactly the theoretical RCT here. Um, so be humble. Uh, the the machine learning use here, I do think improved it. There's far more blue dots over this way. Even up here, some of the blue dots went that way because they have compensated for. We've got no blue dots to the right of the observed black dots here. So it has helped. This is for the number of transitions into and out of housing. And it's still better than where these blue dots are here, but it's still not perfect. So, you know, we need to be humble. These methods are helping, but not a panacea when you've got highly structured things in society like who's in social housing and not. For what it's worth, when we did the type of analysis, it was the number of transitions that mattered and we got some association, but still with quite a lot of uncertainty on it. So, um, there are other sources, so I wrote this presentation about two years ago. There'll be a lot more than this, uh, but these are some of the papers that I have found useful. Um, this one here is uh, I called in as an associate editor of IJE, and they've described how the ensemble model things used in the burden of disease study, for example. Um, and I will finish up there, Laura and Michael, and stop sharing. And I really look forward to the discussion because I think I'll learn stuff here because I don't pretend to be an expert on this. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Blakely. That was fantastic. I uh, really appreciate the clarity that you bring to this, actually, and uh, the translational aspect. And that's why we were so excited to hear you speak. And you've uh, lots of ideas buzzing around. So we'll go to the panel, but a couple quick questions before we do that. And um, I'm just going to read them out. And then I'll introduce the panel and invite everyone else on board for our discussion. So the first question is, when you're describing your G computation slide, um, how do we get to marginal, average marginal effects? Are they one and the same? Okay, so I think what the person's meaning is that when you're using your G computation, you're predicting those outcomes. And so then, yeah, once you've predicted the outcomes, you've got predicted outcomes of people exposed and unexposed. You've got your marginals there, and it's just a simple process of working out the risk difference and rate difference or whatever it is you want to pull out of that. So, yeah, you're predicting your potential outcomes, and then you're pulling off the marginals with that. At least that's my understanding of it, but I'll, if other people want to correct me on that, please do. Yeah. 
I think that's clear. Okay, second question. Um, this is from someone that's fortunate to be studying with you in the area of quantitative bias analysis. And this is something I'm uh, interested in as well as many students here at the school, I know. So can you discuss the intersection between quantitative bias analysis and causal inference and machine learning <laughs> in, in just a minute? <laughs> Is there a role right. here? Yeah. Okay, so those people, I think most of you have quantitative bias analysis, but that's where basically you've done all this work here and you've now got, uh, I still do pretty basic quantitative bias analysis on stratified data. And then you say, well, I couldn't adjust for this confounder. Uh, I got a fair idea this confounder is twice as likely amongst my exposure and it has a one point five, and you redo the analysis at that point. Now, what this person's asking is, how do I weave that quantitative bias analysis into these types of methods here? I believe that's what they're asking. Um, so let's use the G computation again, because it might be a little bit easier with the predicted potential outcomes. If you've got those predicted potential outcomes and you're still concerned about some missing confounder on your data, you could try and weave that through and do a simple bias analysis out here. That would be quite challenging though, because you've got repeated measures in there perhaps, unless it was a simple thing. Um, so I still think you can bring it to bear. Um, as far as doing quantitative bias analysis with machine learning, look, that's beyond my pay grade. I'm just going <laughs> to... Somebody somewhere would have done some work on that. But, um, yeah. you know, the, the, I think that the thing is you do your quantitative bias analysis, you do it simply, and then you move on to doing it probabilistically where you're sampling from uncertainty pre uh, 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 intervals about your bias parameters. I'm not quite clear in my mind how machine learning would help there, but somebody else on this call may know something about this that I don't. Sure. And I think, you know, we're still early on in our quantitative bias analyses methods in terms of integrating them in and having them be more standard and software to do it. So I think it's early days, but there might be might be some things to come. Okay, I'm going to now shift us to the panel discussion. I think it's really important when we do this work to talk to people from different disciplines, including machine learning scientists. We have a couple today, as well as biostatisticians. So I'm going to just uh, introduce our panelists and then we'll get going into some questions. Again, if you have questions, invite you please to put them in the chat. I'll monitor them and keep us going. So the first uh, person on our panel that I'd like to introduce is Dr. Oli Sorella. He's a biostatistician at the Dalai School of Public Health, and he works on methods for causal inference. He's an associate pr uh, professor specifically in biostatistics. He's also the graduate coordinator for the School of Public Health, and his research interests include statistical methods for uh, early detection and prediction of chronic diseases, uh, Bayesian inference, causal inference, and study design. I also just want to note he co-teaches our course in causal mediation analysis, and that course includes both biostatistics students and epidemiology students. So it's a really great opportunity for some cross-disciplinary uh, learning. So welcome, uh, Dr. Sorella. The next person I want to introduce on our panel is Dr. Uh, Elham Dalla, but Badadi, and she's an assistant professor in our Institute for Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the Dalana School of Public Health. And she's a machine learning staff scientist at the Vector Institute. And uh, many of you in Toronto, I know, know what the Vector Institute is, but for those of you that are unfamiliar, it's one of uh, Canada's AI institutes doing cutting edge uh, work in, in uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. She's very passionate about solving problems using artificial intelligence, using uh, machine learning learning and data science, particularly in the healthcare space, improving quality of care for patients and uh, the conditions for health professionals. So she has uh, lots of machine learning expertise, but also a lot of applied expertise about where these machine learning methods matter in practice. And I'm also very happy to introduce finally, um, Dr. Vishwali Maswadi, who's a trainee, a PhD student in computer science and engineering. It's really great to have that perspective here. And she's uh, at the Dr. Uh, Rumi Chanara's lab at NYU and also the Visual and Data Analytics Research Center uh, at NYU. Um, and she's really interested in developing uh, fair probabilistic methods in causal inference and domain adaptations uh, in healthcare, and a real focus on fairness. So uh, really looking forward to these perspectives today. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. Also, uh, Dr. Chayton, Dr. Blakely will be on our panel with us, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So I'm going to start out uh, asking a question uh, to Oli. 
Um, and specifically, it's on machine learning and prediction. So my question for you is, machine learning prediction algorithms are usually trained to optimize the out-of-sample performance, right? So in contrast to similar algorithms um, that we, could, we uh, estimate for causal effects, we want to know whether or not that performance works uh, in the validation steps. And um, do you think these distinction, the prediction versus estimation, the within sample versus out of sample criteria are important? Do you think that we should be clearer in our terminology about this? Yes, so indeed in the presentation, uh, uh, Dr. Blakely referred to, to prediction and, uh, and uh, indeed it's good that uh, we clarify the, the use of this, uh, this terminology first, because in conventional sense, when we, when we develop prediction models, we validate them out of sample. And sometimes we also uh, train those models using out of sample criteria. But it is perhaps a little bit less clear whether we are doing the same thing in the causal inference setting when we are using these two-step estimators that require this pre-processing step. The way I understand it is that oftentimes what we actually want to achieve is sample balance of confounders. And then in that case, there might be reasons why we actually don't want to obtain the best possible prediction, especially for the treatment. Because for example, then we might run at risk of including factors that only predict the treatment, but actually are not confounders. So in that sense, the, the way I see it is that we are doing something slightly different from prediction, although we can use very similar kinds of methods. Would you, Dr. Blakely, have, have any, any comment on, on this, this terminology, use of the term prediction for these two little bit different kinds of tasks? Yeah, thanks, Solly. Uh, I've got two comments. Um, the first one is that if you're doing the propensity score thing and you've got predictors only of the exposure that are not confounders, that's probably not going to help you much. Um, you really want to be including confounders in there. And as I said in the slide, uh, growing consensus that things that predict the outcome, even if they're not predicting the exposure, okay, but just predicting the exposure is probably not best practice. Going back to what you first said, you made a penny drop for me, a coin drop for me in my head as you were talking, because you said, with, and Laura introduced it with the in-sample and outer sample. I hadn't really thought about that before, but I guess I, had implicit, I was implicitly saying that we're using machine learning here to get pre better prediction of, let's do the propensity score of the exposure in-sample. And you're right, is that a lot of the machine learning is about predicting out a sample. And that then made me think about, you know, really old epidemiology textbooks from last century, that when you're dealing with confounding, you actually should be trying to capture the confounding that's out there in the real world. Because if you only do it in your data set, you're at risk of loving and hugging the data too much, getting too close to it, i.e. overfitting. So I haven't seen that, Ollie. I think it's a really good point, but if anybody else in this call has seen this, has anybody <clears throat> explored the fact that when you're doing your machine learning prediction of your propensity score <clears throat> or IPDW, you say, do you actually get better performance by using one score that has also got out of sample prediction that's maximized, even if it's not maximal for in sample, because it's somehow getting closer to what's happening in the general world with confounding structures. So it's a really good point, Ollie. It's not what I'd thought about, but as soon as you said it, it resonated with me as some of this older concepts that we've got to bear. So I think that's a really good point. Yeah, if I may have a follow-up, I think I think you got right to the right to the issue here that there actually may be reasons to also use out of sample criteria mm. when fitting algorithms for for propensity scores. Because like I said, there you really may want to avoid overfit. And oftentimes you, you actually harm the performance of your causal effect estimator if you overfit the propensity scores. So 
indeed there might be some uses also for using out of sample criteria when fitting your propensity scores. But still, I think the issue remains that if in your candidate set of set of covariates, you, if you don't actually know which variables are confounders and which only predict the treatment, these methods may not be able to do very much for you to help select the predictors of treatment from the confounders. So in this sense, you would still need to have some prior knowledge exactly. to determine which are confounders. And of course, you emphasize that very much that we still need yeah, to right back we to detail. The, we still need yeah. the DAC. Yeah, so Judea Pill, we still bring human thought to the data. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Great and great thoughts on that, Oli. Um, so I'm going to go to Vishwali and I'm going to take us somewhere a little bit different. This didn't explicitly come up um, in the talk, although very important when we're thinking of social exposures, which was your sort of last example. So uh, Vishwali, you've been working and developing new methods in the area of multi-level fairness, which is very, uh, very fascinating um, concept. So how must we consider this context of multi-level fairness when we ask causal questions? So just some thought, maybe uh, one sentence on what that is, uh, very briefly for the audience who might not be familiar, and just your thoughts on this. Sure, yeah, that's a wonderful question, actually. So uh, the concept of multi-level fairness kind of involves accounting for the structural factors that can lead to disparities, especially in health outcomes. And this is done by defining something known as sensitive variables, which can lead to disparate outcomes across groups generally. And we do this by defining sensitive variables at both the population and individual level. So there's an entire branch in uh, subfield in computer science known as algorithmic fairness that kind of develops methods to mitigate any unfairness that can result from maybe algorithmic predictions or decisions. And this is mostly focused on individual level sensitive attributes, which something like gender or race. But what I feel is that it's pertinent to go beyond these and think about the different structural factors, such as maybe neighborhood socioeconomic conditions that kind of shape the experiences of individuals and are known to have some sort of lead to some sort of discrimination in general. So um, in the context of machine learning and causal inference in general, I think it's important to first identify where these sources of bias are, both at the population and individual level. So maybe not just account for a variable as the race in the data, but kind of think about uh, different structural factors like childhood socioeconomic status, as well as the mean um, neighborhood income in general and account for these as well when we are trying to make predictions uh, with machine learning models. And with respect to like machine learning, it's kind of important to acknowledge and ensure that this kind of data is well represented and well recorded um, and uh, on, in settings where machine learning models are to be trained. And there's definitely a huge area for developing efficient methods uh, to mitigate these biases and potentially with the goal towards healthy equity. Great. Thank you so much for those concepts. And I really wanted you to talk about it because you know, we were just talking about potentially our, our you know, machine learning based propensity models being overfit, but what if they work better in some subgroups or others based on structural factors, we could potentially have bias and some groups versus others, and that could create bias in our causal estimates. And so some of the work to try and integrate structural factors into these methods, I think is really critical moving us forward. Yeah. And any thoughts? Yeah, Michael. Yeah, I mean, I think I just wanted to build on that too, because it, it relates, I think, to uh, the previous point about within sample versus out of sample. And I think back to sort of real historical, uh, well, not historical historical epidemiology, but to the sort of the idea of Jeffrey Rose's two questions, that there is uh, the within sample question uh, about who is at risk um, that is, you know, uh, associated with all sorts of prediction and medicine, but that the sort of true causal question, the why, it, why is this population have a higher risk, a higher incidence than another population? 
the way to study that, the way to get at that question is not a within sample question, it's a between sample. And so you're, you're, you're describing um, the, the, the differences between populations as, as bias, essentially. But I'm, I'm wondering if, if that's where the richness is, if that is actually where our causal factor lies in that under uh, uh, determining what happens between different populations rather than within one. Yeah, definitely. So um, these, when you capture these different structural factors, we are kind of trying to see the differences that are experienced by people belonging to different groups. So it's not necessarily a question of um, would the outcome be the same had an individual um, been treated differently at the individual level, but also at a population level and what that difference would make when developing these fair algorithms. So I completely agree that the um, point exactly is identifying if there are these differences that can be accounted at the population level. All right, I want to uh, go to Elham because she is the machine learning scientist actually trying to work in the space. And uh, uh, you know, I think as epidemiologists, we come with our paradigm and our thinking and I, uh, I certainly have appreciated interacting more with computer scientists and machine uh, learning researchers about, um, you know, challenging some of my assumptions in the way I approach problems. So my question for you, Elham, you know, we're clearly a little obsessed with causal questions, as you can see, um, as epidemiologists. I just want to know at a high level, how important is causal inference in the machine learning space? Is it something that is a focus for machine learning research? And if it's not, any ideas why or why not? Um, thanks, Laura. Uh, hi, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. And that's a very good question. And uh, to be honest, Laura, uh, recently, ML scientists and computer scientists also became obsessed with uh, causal inference. And it's a really hot topic these days. And if we look at the, the, the venues and conferences, we see that most of the, the scientists are like, uh, are tackling this issue. And the reason for that is, um, so uh, actually I wanna elaborate more on the, the deep learning side of thing. And the reason for that, we have heard about um, success stories about machine learning and deep learning in particular. It's very powerful in finding patterns in large amounts of data, major breakthroughs in natural language processing and computer vision tasks. However, it, it is not still at its, its uh, full potential as Benjiu says, and uh, it, it has its own shortcoming because it's, it's, uh, deep learning is very good at uh, finding associations between the, the input and the, the output and the target. So for those of you who are not familiar with the deep learning, deep learning is a deep network of neurons and mimics the way that the, the human brain works in terms of neurons and uh, synapse. Uh, deep network, a deep neural network has several layers of neuron and um, uh, the way it works is that the connection between the neurons are adjusted gradually by learning from data until it responds uh, in the, the, the correct way. And um, so at each layer of the network, we learn um, nonlinear, we learn a representation from the data. So we have, uh, we can have um, from, from few to hundred layers and uh, all the representation, different representations from the data will be combined at the final layer to, to make some predictions. So, um, but um, deep learning um, kind of achievements were mainly for associative problems. And, uh, but, but some problems, for example, in the health domain, they require algorithms to answer causal question. What if, so I, I don't want to spend too much time on this because the, the, the kind of uh, Tony and Michael and uh, other panels have, have already uh, explained uh, uh, kind of, uh, kind of, um, focus on this but uh, but the thing is that um, bringing causality into machine learning and deep learning is not only useful for answering causal questions it also helps with fixing the shortcomings of the deep learning models such as uh, generalization robustness and uh, explainability so this would enable deep learning to go one step further than just pattern recognition and can answer question about the the problems you know uh, when we move from very narrow situations. So 
once training a deep narrowing, um, if the data is biased, which is the case, most of so kind of uh, we, we, there is no way that we can have the kind of um, the entire data in the world. But so the deep learning will be very biased toward the data that it has been trained on. So uh, so kind of any manipulation in terms of intervention policy treatment, uh, it, it changes the data generation mechanism and it would uh, impact the the outcome of the deep learning. So that's why even in the domain of machine learning, uh, researchers have started exploring uh, improve kind of um, bringing causality into into the modeling and and uh, kind of in terms of generalization, it's really um, applicable to the health domain, uh, especially in epidemiology, because any modeling or decision making would be should be generalized to the to the population wide data. So if um, I, I wanted to kind of um, bring up some some uh, kind of um, efforts that have been done in this domain, but I wonder mm -hmm. if there is another round, maybe I can. Sure, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think you've given us uh, yeah. lots to think about and mm -hmm. then we'll see how we are for time and come back to those. And I really appreciate you uh, bringing the deep learning example mm -hmm. in here. And um, also very interesting to to hear about the the interest in this area, which I think means more, more working together. Um, any comments or reflections? Uh, yes. Before, yeah, go ahead. Yes, <laughs> I think Alan's uh, really come at a point here. Uh, think about again to cardiovascular disease risk prediction. I can do, not me, but I, somebody could do a fantastic machine learning prediction in this place at this time, and it just so happened at this time that people were using some test that's completely unassociated with CBD, but they were doing it only amongst people who went to a CBD ticket uh, clinic, and this variable suddenly really predictive. And it outperforms our normal models and predicting CBD that we based on theory. But when you take it somewhere else, it's hopeless. Right. And so this is often happens with these risk prediction things. They don't work well over here. Now, what I heard Ellen say is that there's now deep interest with deep learning <laughs> to actually make sure that that first prediction equation has as much of the causal stuff in it. And what I hear her saying is that because then that'll maximize the chance it'll work not just in New Zealand, but also in Toronto in five years' time. I think that's a really, really exciting junction of epidemiology and machine learning. I'm really excited about that. Absolutely. Thank you so much for emphasizing that point. I totally agree. Um, okay, Oli, I'm going to go to you again. So, uh, because this is a question that's also coming up in the Q&A. So, in terms of statistical properties of the resulting estimators, we're concerned with the uh, bias variance trade-off, right? We talk about that all the time. Um, and we want to minimize some criteria based on these. And, and mean squared error uh, was brought up in the Q&A. So, that's one uh, uh, criteria why how we might do this. So, how can we avoid overfitting? Um, and this kind of relates to what you brought up before when applying machine learning algorithms and um, how we can we differentiate the noise from let's say, uh, or instrumental variables, or do we have to still do this a priori or can we do this uh, using data-driven methods like some of the approaches that Elham was just talking about? Yes, so we entered the discussion a little bit already in the, in the previous round and and I think here the advice is fairly clear that when using these algorithms, we definitely should not be chasing the best possible within sample prediction, because it's very easy to overfit, throw in the kitchen sink, and especially when, when the algorithms are very non-parametric, when they allow interactions, non-linearities, it's easy to overfit to the data. And we know that it's not a good idea to do that for the propensity scores because it harms the properties of the resulting causal inference estimators. It is less harmful for the outcome models because good prediction of the outcome doesn't harm us so much. Although yeah. it might and we don't, produce. but we don't typically use mean squared error when developing propensity methods, right? So that's going to be a bit of a shift. Yes. Yeah, so um, in the so way that we do this. I think the conclusion from this is that is that we probably should be thinking about applying out of sample type of criteria when right. training these models to avoid overfitting our models within sample. And like I like I argued before, even if we do that, it still doesn't quite help us in the second problem that 
For example, if we have unknown instrumental variables in our candidate set of covariates, things that only predict the exposure or treatment, but not the outcome, we know that we shouldn't include those in our propensity score, but then what if we don't know which ones are instrumental variables? Yeah. Well, I think the machine learning algorithm cannot really do much to help us in that if we are only using it to fit propensity scores. And then, then again, we actually have to do some pre-processing or thinking. We need some a priori knowledge of the, of the important, important confounders, important uh, predictors of the outcomes. So machine learning doesn't solve all of our problems. Right. Absolutely. Okay. We're, we only have two minutes left and it went by really quickly. I want to make sure I give Vishwali another, uh, another uh, chance to just speak um, on anything you'd like uh, reflection. I wanted to ask you about um, this branch of machine learning called causal discovery. You can talk about that um, if you'd like, or any reflection that you have just going forward. You're, yeah. you're our future, so I want to give you the last word. <laughs> yeah, I definitely like to talk a bit about causal discovery because this touches upon a lot of ideas that we discussed today. So that so the entire concept in causal discovery is recovering causal relations from data. And while traditionally our cities are a gold standard for that, there are several challenges with that, like financial costs, ethical constraints, and more and more as with the advent of big data, and there's been a plethora of data that's available for developing these cause and discovery algorithms. And the idea is not to get away from theory, but more about identifying if the data that we are looking at is representative of the theory in the first place. Hmm. So these causal discovery algorithms kind of output a DAG, which everyone uses to test their assumptions essentially. And uh, there's been a lot of work in using these causal discovery algorithms with respect to health as well. And this is traditionally done with the help of individual level information collected from simple electronic medical records. But I do see that there's a lot of potential for improving on these algorithms um, in the way that we can all, we should incorporate population level information along with these individual level data, more so to recover the re different relations um, and ensure that we are capturing the maximum information. And on another note about robustness and developing robust machine learning models, um, these causal graphs kind of provide an avenue to in structure, uh, structure our training process and be smart in the way that we are developing these robust machine learning models. So as Professor Blakely mentioned, like training an algorithm in Melbourne, can that, can that be used in Toronto? Well, that can be guided by the causal graph that can be built from data from all of these different places. So that's one way forward in which um, causal discovery can lead to more robust machine learning development. Absolutely. So I think that's just a great note to end off on. It sounds like the topic of our next conversation. <laughs> I really want to hear more about this. It sounds like a little bit of back and forth, uh, learning from the data, but also reinforcing it using our strong uh, causal assumptions and knowledge of the area, which we've heard so much about. So I just want to thank you all so much for your time. It's been a very thought-provoking session. I have about a dozen other questions, which is a good sign. It means we've provoked conversation. That's the purpose of these sessions. We provoke some ideas. It sounds like some specific applications that we could work on. Uh, I want to special thanks to Professor Blakely for waking up so early and stimulating uh, this discussion with such a great uh, talk. And of course, our panelists, Elham, Vishwali, and Oli, and Michael for uh, co-organizing this event and uh, pushing us to talk more about this at the school and hopefully at all schools of public health. I think this is a discussion that we need to be having uh, more and more. I know our students uh, are very interested in it as well. So thank you all for coming. Um, thank you for your, your time and attention. Stay safe and uh, have a great evening, day, uh, whatever time zone you're in. <laughs>